Good morning, Chairperson uh, and members of the committee. My name is Motlati Komote. I'm a research and advocacy officer at the Dula Omar Institute. Chairperson, I just wanted to note the fact before I, I even begin uh, that my anxiety levels are quite heightened because I have been waiting for more than 30 minutes uh, for my session to start as I was notified that it would start a little bit earlier. Uh, but so it, please forgive me if I make any mistakes along the way. I think as the presentation progresses, uh, I'll feel much better. But thank you very much for this opportunity to make an oral submission to the committee. I just wanted to start off by noting who the Dula Omar Institute is. Sorry, okay, um, oh, there we go. So we are the Dula Omar Institute, as I have already stated, we are based at the University of the Western Cape, and we do work to realize the democratic values and human rights enshrined in South Africa's constitution. Our institute is founded on the belief that our constitutional order must promote good governance, socioeconomic development, and the protection of rights of vulnerable and disadvantaged persons. I would like to note that the Dula Omar Institute is comprised of many units, including the Women, Dem Women and Democracy Initiative, um, sorry, Women and Democracy Initiative, which I am a part of, the African Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, team as well, uh, and the Social Economic Rights Project, amongst many others. Chair, I just wanted to provide a background on the written submission that we made in November of 2019. Our original submission focused on public participation and transparency, governance of the NHI board, including the composition and the roles of the different stakeholders in the appointment process and the roles of provinces uh, and the DHMOs amongst others. We made a series of recommendations based on provisions that have been outlined in the National Health Insurance Bill of 2019. And our presentation today will largely be based on our expertise in governance matters. I just want to further note that the Dula Omar Institute are not in any case experts on public health care, and we do not claim so. We are merely here to make a presentation on governance issues. So part of my presentation will deal with three key messages, which is basically that the NHI board plays a very critical role in the sense that it has an impact on the public uh, in terms of providing, or in terms of the provision of health care services. Uh, the NHI will have a large impact on our finances uh, as a country. And we see the NHI as an opportunity to redistribute healthcare services, particularly to rural areas. I note that the previous speaker made a very touching uh, contribution earlier on about people with disabilities and how they cannot always access and the challenges they faced with, I mean, in accessing healthcare. So we would like to note that and, and reiterate what they have previously said. Parliament is the constitutional site for public involvement, as we all know. And then thirdly, the legislature, in this instance, Parliament, must play a bigger role in the NHI than is currently envisaged. Okay, the main themes of today's presentation will be on the board appointment processes, transparency, and public involvement. I would like to start off by noting the fact that Article 12.1 of the UN International Con Con Covenant sorry, on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights states that each party uh, must undertake steps to provide uh, or progressively achieve the full realization of rights recognized in the covenant by all appropriate means, including the adoption of legislative measures. Today, I'd like to note that in terms of the current version of the NHI bill, um, there is reference made to universal health coverage, um, which aims to provide South Africans with access to decent health care that is of sufficient quality. Chair, I would like to note, and, and members of the committee, we support the current version of the NHI bill in principle. 
However, we have some concerns. Part of our main concern is that the NHI bill is partly exclusionary in the sense that it excludes non-South Africans. Chair, I will not go into a lot of detail around that, but I just thought that we would note that, and I know that other civil society organizations who will be invited or have been invited to make presentations will provide some outline of the concerns relating to exclusionary parts of the bill. I would like to start off by speaking around Parliament and its democratic role, uh, particularly around its constitutional and legislative obligations. In terms of Section 59.1 of the Constitution, the National Assembly in Parliament must facilitate public involvement in legislative and other processes of the Assembly and its committees. And also, Chair, uh, there is, I think, a very popular case that we are all aware of, Doctors for Life International versus Speak of the National Assembly and others, that provides an overview of what constitutes reasonable public participation in legislative processes. I want to note, Chair, that COVID-19 has presented an extra layer of challenges regarding public accessibility to the legislatures and to healthcare. Okay, I just want to note the fact that what I have previously said are obviously things that the committee is very much aware of. So we're just noting that as part of our presentation. On my first point around governance in the NHI, we would like to speak about the board appointment process. So in terms of what is currently found in uh, the NHI bill, the minister has a lot of centralized power. And essentially, the bill provides autonomous power to the Minister of Health to both appoint and dismiss board members and the chairperson to the NHI board. Our recommendation is that we diffuse this role of the minister and involve other stakeholders. What this would entail is that it would ensure that the minister or any or would ensure that there is no undue political interference that we have previously noted in SOE appointments, which are similar to the board that would be created by, by the NHI. Some of the lessons that we have learned in SOE processes have been dealt with extensively by courts, for example, in the SABC case where a previous minister had interfered in the work of the board. What we have noted and strongly noted in this presentation as well is that there's a possible danger that the NHI board may be faced with similar problems if we do not make the necessary changes to the bill. I wish to note that the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, referred to as the OECD, provides clear guidelines and principles which should be followed by organizations or corporations in terms of good corporate governance. Good corporate governance principles strongly suggest that power must not lie with one individual, in this instance, the Minister of Health, and that rather there should be a decentralization of power and diffusing of power. Chair, we wish to note that we need to consider other mechanisms for transparency and public involvement, some of which I am here to discuss in this presentation. <clears throat> Chair, part of our recommendations uh, are that there must be more debates held in Parliament and in this process on whether the Minister or President should make the final appointment of persons to the NHI board. Uh, Chair, we wish to reiter reiterate that other high level processes that have a significant public impact, um, for example, the Municipal Demarcation Board, the Public Protector and the JSC SC, um, have a role for the president instead of the minister in terms of making final appointments. In our view, the president should be responsible for the final appointment of persons to the NHI board. Chair, just to note that we had actually provided in our original written submission uh, some opportunity for the committee to engage on some alternative 
recommendations that we had made regarding this. In this presentation, we'd like to note that this is our final recommendation. And then Chair, I would like to speak to the role of the appointment structures and the minister currently in, in the NHI form. Currently, there is a limited role for the advisory panel in the bill. Uh, we are not in agreement with the establishment of an ad hoc advisory panel in its current form. As I noted previously, the minister has a lot of centralized power, which we are very much against. Our recommendation is that Parliament relooks the NHI bill and that instead of having an ad hoc advisory panel, that an appointment structure with extended powers, which would limit the minister's role, should be established instead. Um, Chair, just to note that these recommendations relate to section 14 and section 13 of uh, the NHI bill in which the minister would appoint both the board and the chairperson. So I'm just noting that in terms of making references. In terms of the composition of who would be on this uh, appointment committee, we believe that anybody who occupies any position on any of the committees or any of uh, the boards on the NHI bill must be someone who is impartial. They must have knowledge on particular matters, for example, healthcare, and they must have the necessary skills and competence um, that are relevant to the board. Sorry, Chair, I'm just experiencing some technical difficulties. There we go. In terms of the responsibilities, we believe that the appointment, <clears throat> appointing structure, I mean to say, should be in charge of the call for nominations, shortlisting interviews, recommendations to the president and or the minister. They must also be in charge of ensuring transparency in processes and ensuring that there's meaningful public involvement in any process relating to the NHI bill. I would also like to note that my colleagues, the Fissa and Waterhouse, have rightfully argued in their paper, SOE Boards and Democracy, that in order for us to increase transparency and accountability, uh, any call for any call for nominations and appointments should include reasonable opportunities for the public to provide inputs, both in the nomination and appointment processes. Chair, in terms of the nominations and shortlist, we believe that the appointment structure, which I have made reference to, should re be responsible for the call for nominations. Some of our non-negotiables are that the public must have full access to the call for nominations and must be provided with adequate timeframes. Chair, I cannot tell you what the adequate timeframes are, but I believe that we all know, as, as we have previously seen in other appointment processes, that it is not conducive to provide information at a last minute to members of the public and expect them to engage. And then in terms of this appointing structure, shortlisting and interviews, both shortlisting of the long list and the shortlist must be made public. And the reasons must be provided as to why some people were appointed and others were not. The appointment structure that we are recommending would ideally make recommendations to the minister and or the president and the president and or the minister would make the final appointment and provide reasons. As I've previously stipulated, we would prefer that the, the president, I mean to say, makes the final recommendation. One of the key things that we also wish to reiterate is the fact that in terms of board dissolution, uh, section 13.9a, I, uh, 
provides the minister with the power to dissolve the board of the fund on good cause shown. In our opinion, this is very vague and it is important that a list of possible reasons for dissolution should be provided in the bill. Again, Chairperson, the OECD and other good governance uh, mechanisms that are available note that um, reasons should be provided both for dissolution and, and uh, for nominations of persons. Furthermore, Chair, we wish to reiterate that the bill must require that the information relating to the reasons for dissolving the board should be made available for public record and scrutiny to ensure public transparency and accountability. The bill must include the fact that the minister may only dissolve a board after presenting arguments for this to parliament. Again, Chair, we very much wish to note quite strongly that the minister should not have as many autonomous powers as is currently provided for in the NHI bill. Okay, before I move on to the next uh, section, I wish to also note some points that I, I, I did not make earlier. Chair, one of the things that we, re that we really think are quite important uh, in terms of board appointments and appointments of any other persons to the NHI board is transparency. We believe that there must be transparency in all processes of the bill uh, throughout. So okay, I would like to note additional problem areas that we have identified in the NHI bill. I wish to note that we are not in any way going to focus on the role of provinces and the DHMOs, but rather that I will make a very brief overview of some of the concerns that we have identified. The large part or the biggest part of our presentation is around governance. So in terms of the roles of provinces currently provided in the NHI bill, we have some key concerns. So in terms of compet competency, the role of provinces or provinces play a concurrent role in providing healthcare services along with national government in terms of the constitution. As it currently stands in the bill, there's very limited clarity on the role of provinces and other than their delegation as management agents of the NHI. <clears throat> Excuse me. We wish to note that uh, provinces, as we all know, receive an equitable share, which would then be transferred to the NHI fund as per the bill as a form of income. The plan for the role of provinces needs to be properly articulated. Chair, we have seen quite strongly with the pandemic how challenging providing healthcare services at provincial level can be, can be. So we are concerned with decisions and how these would impact on the role of a provincial legislature in providing oversight over the funds. We wish to note that we cannot take away the critical role of the provinces in implementing the NHI and strongly encourage Parliament to reconsider along with other civil society organizations or any other member of the public that is interested in the NHI bill around fully defining what the role of provinces would be in the bill. The second part would be around the district health management offices or the DHMOs. Currently in our, in our opinion, there is confusion on the role of DHMOs similar to that of the role of provinces that I have previously outlined. The bill in its current form does not account for the important role that is undertaken at a district level in the provision of healthcare services. And part of our areas of concern are that clarity is needed and this particular section of the bill along with that of the provinces must be strengthened accordingly with input from members of the public and other civil society organizations such as the RHAP section 27 and TAC. Lastly, Chair, we wish to note that in terms of the advisory committees that have been outlined throughout the <clears throat> NHI bill, 
We wish to note that the role of the public is important in all advisory committees as stipulated in the bill. And the public would not just be civil society organizations such as ourselves, but it would also include members of the public. Ideally, advisory committees should include CSOs and members of the public as health system users. We strongly note that any advisory committee should not mainly constitute government and the private sector. Part of my final remarks in closing today are to note that firstly, we recommend that parliament plays a stronger role on the NHI than is currently envisaged. We note that parliament has a duty and an active role to play. Some of the lessons learned in SOEs in particular have taught us that corruption state capture are rife when mechanisms are not in place at all stages of the process. We note that clarity must be provided on outstanding matters that we have outlined, i.e. the DHMOs and the role of provinces. Chair, I did not say this at the beginning of my presentation, but I just wanted to note that the NHI bill will provide so many responsibilities and will be dealing with large amounts of public money. Chair, I wish to note that we need to ensure that throughout the whole process of incorporating the NHI bill, that we must be very careful of making mistakes that we have previously seen play out in South Africa and obviously uh, outside of South Africa, Chair. I wish to note that it would not be conducive for us as a country at all to undergo processes similar to the Zonda Commission. And I wish to note that what is ideally needed in this NHI bill is fixing parts around the governance issues so that we do not have to deal with these matters 10, 20 years from now, similar to what we're dealing with and seeing in terms of corruption and state capture uh, at the Zonda Commission. I wish to note that transparency is an important part of the process. And I would encourage and, and, and in fact would state that we as civil society organizations are very much supportive of the goal of achieving universal health care as uh, defined in terms of Article 12 of the UN Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. So I wanted to also lastly thank the committee for providing us with this opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you.